In this video, we're going to examine the sketching tools inside of the 3D Sketch environment for Autodesk Inventor. So here I have a new part file, and I'm going to begin my 3D Sketch environment by starting the 3D Sketch command here in the upper left. Once I start that, you can see I'm entered into the environment with the 3D Sketch contextual tab and the 3D Sketch icon showing up in my browser. I'm going to start my line command here, and I'm presented with a triad. This triad is a indication of the positive x, y, and z direction, which is also shown in the lower left area of the graphical interface. But this is just a little bit more heads up. It's showing me where I'm at currently. If I was to start clicking somewhere, let's say here, 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 and here, how do we know that we're building in three dimensions? Because it kind of looks like it's two dimensions right now. Well, if I do rotate my design here with my cube, you can see that it does look like it's sort of in three dimensions. Well, how do I make sure that I can create something on two dimensions while I'm inside of three dimensions? So I don't necessarily go in X, Y, and Z direction all the time. Well, that's actually pretty easy. Here I'm going to go ahead and delete this. Start my line command again. And this time on my view cube, I'm gonna choose my front view, which is just the positive X and positive Y. If I start drawing here, and then rotate it, you can see I'm only building on that flat plane. If I go to my right side here on the view cube and start building, and then rotate it, you can see it's only building in that direction now as well. So if you use your view cube very easily, you can get yourself some nice flat directionality inside of your 3D sketch environment. I'm gonna hit escape to cancel, and just highlight this and choose delete. Now, what if I want to actually build logically in the X, Y, and Z directions? Well, I'll go ahead and start my line command again. And this time, I'm going to turn on a helper tool. I'm going to go up to my draw panel and hit the expanded arrow and turn on precise input. This will bring up a little mini toolbar here for me that has X, Y, and Z values, as well as the ability to choose between a relative and absolute coordinate entry, and also the ability to reposition the triad or reset it back to the origin. So I'm going to leave this on relative. That's the most common way to do this. If you used absolute, every coordinate you put in there is going to be the absolute coordinate in Cartesian space, not necessarily what you normally know. So here I'll use relative. And to get started, I'm going to choose a 0, 0, and 0 starting point. And to get between those input boxes, I simply chose tab on my keyboard to cycle through. Once I have my coordinates inputted, I'll hit enter. Now I'll start my line at 0, 0, 0. Now, if I'd like to build out a certain value in the x, y, and z direction, I simply put the positive or negative value based on my triad into these input boxes. So I'd like to go negative 3 in the x. And I also would like to go negative 5 in the y. Now I'll tab over to my z. I would like to go out in the positive z direction, a value of 7. Enter, and that creates my line segment. Here I'll zoom out so we can see it better. Now if I rotate my cursor, you can see when I'm looking straight on to the original references that I went to the left, I went down, and I came out those values. Now I'd like to go just straight down. So instead of a value change in the X, I'll leave that at zero. I'll tab over to the Y. I would like to go down 10, so I'd use negative there. And for the Z, also I don't want to change that, so I'll leave that at zero and my line went straight down. So you can use this for flat directionality as well, but you have to type it in. So we've learned two different ways we can do that. One, by adjusting the view cube to a flat orientation, or two, by using the input boxes inside a precise input. So here I go back to the front view, and this way I'll just go a value of, let's say 15 in the X. Since I have precise input turned on, I might have to go over to these other boxes and specify zeros for the other values. There we go. So pay close attention to if you're using precise input or not. Now, as I'm building these, it's actually creating very sharp segments. If my goal here is to create a three-dimensional path or a sweep or a loft or some other advanced piece of geometry, I don't really have that smooth transition. So I'm going to hit escape here and see what I can do about fixing these sharp corners. As you notice in our draw panel, we don't have a command called fillet. Instead, we have a command called bend. I'll go ahead and start that command. And this works like a three-dimensional fillet. Now, 0.25 inches is kind of small in comparison to the size of the lines we have, so I'm going to make this a value of 2 instead. Go ahead and click on two segments, and it's going to add that bend in there. 
Now this equal button here pushed down means every bend that I create going forward will also be that two value linked to the first bend. If I exit out of there and choose an undo, it's gonna undo that last bend I did. So I can come back in here and do something else instead of two, like let's say I wanna choose three. And then choose those two segments. There we have it. Now there are controls where you can create automatic bend intersections. So that as I was building this shape, I could have had the bends automatically going in there as I continued my segment creations. That is not something you have turned on by default. You have to adjust that. I'm gonna to go to my tools and look at my document settings. On our sketching tab, we have a 3D sketch auto bend radius. Currently it's set to 0.25, which as you observed was my default every time I went back into that dialog. Well, maybe my 3D sketch auto bend radius is the default to be a one instead. Let's do that. I'll choose okay. So now the auto bend radius is set. If I go back here to my bend command, you can see it starts at one inch, but it doesn't control the fact that it needs to build automatically. To do that, we need to go back to tools and click on application options. Here on the sketch tab, we can turn on the auto bend with 3D line creation. I'll choose OK to that. Go back to my 3D sketch tab and start my line command again. Here, I'm going to close my mini toolbar for precise input. I'm going to build off of this point. Notice how you can attach to the end of that. And I'm going to go this way. You can see it automatically put that bend value of one in there. Then I'll go straight up as well. I'll right click and choose OK. And then I can also choose items like perpendicularity with a simple geometric constraint. But I did get my auto bend radius to fill out automatically as I went through there, which can be very beneficial if you're building a tube or a pipe sort of route in order to do a consistent bend radius as you go through your design. Now, just to show you a few of the other tools we have here, there is a helical curve command, which acts very similar to the coil command inside of Autodesk Inventor, where we can choose a starting point for this and then a endpoint for the helix. You know, let's just say I use my existing geometry here for that. Here I'll rotate a little bit so we can see better what's going on. I can specify the exterior diameter of this particular helix as well. So I got my helix created, but I need to specify perhaps my adjustments for diameter, pitch, revolutions, and taper. Here I can have a positive taper or a negative taper to adjust how that spring is going to look. This can be a beneficial tool if you're creating custom cut threads or you're creating a really complex shape geometry for a sweep or a coil type of look to your design. We also have our helix ends to adjust to a natural or a flat start or end structure. Here I'll choose OK to create that helix. Now I normally don't create the helix here a lot Traditionally, I like to use the coil command just because it does a lot of the same geometry for me. But if you feel you have to use the helix instead because you're running into problems with a particular coil you're trying to create, this can be a way around that. I really like the positioning methods I can control with the coil command though. Now we also have our arc command up here for our three point and center point arcs. As mentioned in a previous video, we also have our spline controls for a control vertex or interpolation spline. I'll go ahead and look at the equation curve here as well where you can define a parabolic equation curve or other types of graphical curves with the X, Y, and Z, as well as our T min, T max. We can choose between Cartesian, cylindrical, or spherical coordinates. So we have a lot of control there if you want to get really fancy and mathematical with your design shapes. I'll go ahead and close that out. We also have our point command, and we can also put in our manual bend as we saw earlier. We'll take a look at some of these other tools in our next video. In this video, we're going to examine a few more of our 3D sketching tools inside of Autodesk Inventor. So here I have the 3D sketching tools IPT open, and I'm going to create a little bit of geometry that kind of builds on what we have. I'm going to start my 3D sketch command and begin my line tool. Now, as I begin the line command, notice that I can actually reference this curvature as a starting point. It's actually picking up the center point of that for me. So when I click here, it'll grab onto it. Now, as I want to build out straight from here, I could use precise input, or I could rotate my cube to get to a certain orientation, and then click to create it. Notice, though, that that is not a very straight line. It has a little bit of a bump in it. We'll fix that later. Next, I would like to actually hook onto this plane 
before I go through the hole that's behind it. So if I rotate this over and right click and choose a command option called align to plane, I can basically click anywhere I want on this plane to attach to. Now, if I try to hook onto this curvature, it's going to go straight through it. However, if I click somewhere else around there, it's actually going to stop at that plane orientation. Now, I could go into this curvature next. I'll go ahead and click there. Notice how that is jogged over a little bit. Again, we can fix that in a little bit. And then I'll go straight through with a rotation here to the right and toggle off the align to plane to go straight through there. Make sure I stay on the right there. Then I'll go also straight up. Right click and choose OK. So I can see some automatic bends in here going through there. Perhaps I want to straighten that out a little bit. So I could use some geometric constraints to help me do that. Here I'm going to choose the collinear. Pick on both of those line segments. And it tells me I do have a constraint that's going to be caused to fail because of a bend. I'll go ahead and cancel that. I'll go ahead and find this bend and delete it. So now I just have a straight condition there. Let's try collinear again. There you can see it straighten that out for me. However, you can see it straightened it out to actually go at a weird angle through that hole. So here I'm going to use my include geometry command. Pick on this curvature here. It's already connected at this point here going through that curvature. And I'm going to make a coincident constraint with this line to this included geometric point to straighten that out. Now up here, I also have some conditions where it's not coming straight out of here anymore. So I could use a parallel option between these lines, and that will straighten that out for me. As you can see there. I'm also going to adjust this value from 5 to 10. Notice how they are all linked together, so they're updating accordingly. I could click on these additional ones. Instead of being linked to D34, simply change that value to something else, such as 7. This one over here, I'm going to make this one 20. Now here, we're seeing that this line doesn't go straight up and down. What I could do again is include geometry, reference that line, then choose parallel between those. Now I still have a lot of green geometry, which is something you're going to fight quite a bit with 3D sketching tools because now you're working with constraints in three dimensions and how they're controlled. But one of the things here that's going to help me is adding a dimension to this particular segment. So I'll go ahead and start my geometric dimension command. And I could pick this point to this point down here. You can see how that goes at an angle instead. If I hit escape and just do this line segment, you can see it actually travels all the way down to where the intersection of those two lines would have been. And here I'll make this instead of 83, I'll make it an even 100. But also notice that that is still not enough to constrain this particular segment. So what if I dimension from this point to this face over here? That will let me click to a face to actually dimension it. Here I'll choose 80. I'll go ahead and adjust that to 100. Just so you can see what's happening, it's pushing it out a little bit further. This geometry here also still needs some control. Here I'll make this a 225. But it also still has some degree of freedom left inside of it. Now I might have to play with this a little bit more to understand exactly what I'm needing. Let's try an angle. Well, it says the angle constraint will create a driven dimension, and it doesn't really help me. I'll go ahead and cancel that. Well, what about the length of this particular line here? How about we put this in to be 150? That does a little bit better job locking that down. We're going to right click and choose OK. And I'm going to come in here and just kind of play with the points on here. You can see it actually fully constrained it in place. The color just didn't update on it for me. Now I could use this 3D sketch to create a sweep that goes through this geometry to create really complex methods of that sweep creation. If I had done this in two-dimensional planes with a sweep, it would have been very difficult. I might have had to do it in multiple attempts. So here I can do it in just this one fluid three-dimensional sketch. Next, we'll take a look at this curve that we have up here, and we would like to wrap this around a cylinder. Now we might do this because a certain piece of geometry, like a cam follower or a barrel cam, might require this sort of curvature to wrap around the cylinder to create your cut. And that might be something really hard to do without these tools. So here I'm going to use the project to surface command. I'll grab this face in this curve. 
go up there and choose that button. And I have three methods. I can project along a vector. I can project to a closest point. Or in this particular case, wrap to surface makes sense. I'll go ahead and choose OK. And it wraps that curvature around the cylinder based on where it was residing. So you can see a nice wrap. Now, obviously, I would constrain this curvature to make it a little bit more logical for what it's going to be when it wraps around it. But as you can see, that does exactly what I wanted it to do. If I undo that and try a different method, such as this face in this curve, using the project along vector, and choose OK, it creates a same sort of wrapping around there, but not quite the same. It actually looks like it goes end to end, and it basically just goes along that vector being pushed onto it. So a couple different responses there based on our tool and the selections we make. Next up, we'll look at a different file, Intersection Curve IPT. And in this particular case, I have a couple of surfaces already created. And these were surfaces created with just our normal sketching tools and splines or curves, whatever it is we use to create this. However, the goal that I have is to somehow get an intersection of how these surfaces meet. Because based on these two compound surfaces, I need to have a path that represents where they connect. I actually use this quite a bit when I get into tough spots with geometry. Now this tool that we're going to learn, the 3D intersection curve, can be done with these types of surfaces, or it can be done with a surface and a face. So it doesn't have to be all surfaces. I'll go ahead and start my 3D sketch command, begin my intersection curve, and pick on both of these surfaces. I'll choose OK, and what will be generated is a three-dimensional curve where it would intersect these two surfaces completely. And if I rotate this, you can see how that really works out. So if you're having a hard time creating the curve itself, create a couple of complex surfaces and then use that to bridge your gap of geometry to help you create this particular shape that you might need. So this has been our look at 3D sketching, a little bit more advanced tools such as our intersection curve, our project to curve the surface, as well as our more in-depth look at general sketching as well as our geometric constraints and dimensional constraints.